So next I'd like to call on uh, Hannah McCurdy Adams and Hannah is going to introduce today's speaker. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm really looking forward to the travel log today, uh, particularly because I recommended that we reach out to this person and I'm not sure that he knows that. Um, but I do promise this was before I knew he was actually running for the student director position with CHS. Uh, but it'll be a good, a good series of photos for sure. Um, so I've only recently met Ryan, but he's been an absolute joy to work with. Uh, not least of which because he answers my emails so quickly. <laughs> He's very obviously dedicated to conservation and bringing the community he is involved with along with his work. Um, like many of us, he's been a herper since childhood before going on to study environmental biology in university. He completed his Bachelor of Science degree at McMaster University in Ontario and is currently completing his Master's of Science degree at the University of Toronto in Niall Rawlinson's lab on blue racer conservation. This past spring, I had the fantastic chance to join his field crew on Pelee Island to dive after blue racers. One of my favorite days was our last day at one of the sites with the lowest density of blue racers. We caught a couple racers and called that the icing on the top of the cake to round out our spring season. But by the time we caught the whipped cream on the cherry on the icing on the top of the cake blue racer, we were spontaneously bursting into laughter at our shock and good fortune. I'll be keeping an eye out for a photo of one of those snakes we caught during the travelogue. And I really look forward to seeing what Ryan continues to do in the future. I learned a fair bit about photography from him and have enjoyed seeing his gorgeous posts on social media. So this should be a joy to watch. Take it away, Ryan. Oh, I got on mute. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. I did not know that you uh, recommended me for this. So that's uh, that's really funny. And I don't think I have a picture of that of that day uh, <laughs> in the travelogue. But um, yeah, I will I'll go through some other pictures for sure. Uh, okay, percent. <clears throat> so is this all good? Thumbs up? Perfect. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, showing up early. I know for some of you this is uh, early in the day and others it's maybe getting close to lunchtime you're wanting to eat something. So thanks for coming to listen. Uh, and thank you, Hannah, for that awesome introduction. I didn't know you were doing introduction either. So that's so nice. Um, and I was so glad to have you as part of the team this spring. Yeah, so I'm doing the travelogue, um, and it's going to be a little bit different than uh, last year's from James and Julia, where they went abroad, and this time I'm doing something I'm calling the No Travel uh, Travelogue, What the Herb, uh, and it's time to turn local. And so I really don't have to go over this slide because Hannah did it for me. Um, you now know who I am and, and everything that's, that's on here, so let's get started. Uh, so No Travel in the Travelogue, What Gives? Um, as we all know and are super used to at this point, uh, the pandemic really restricted what we were able to do these past two years in terms of travel. We couldn't go international and only recently could we really do anything um, domestically within Canada as well. And so uh, over these last two years, not being able to travel, uh, what fun herping can you do? And so I'm kind of taking the opportunity to, to talk about some of the, of the local species you can go out and find and uh, what you can do around your own hometowns um, to still have a good time going out to find new species or, or set new goals for yourself um, to complete closer to home. So hopefully by the end of it, uh, you'll be encouraged to do that on your own time as well. <clears throat> so uh, I live in Southern Ontario, um, right around here uh, and we, in, the entirety of Southern Ontario, we have about 48 species and subspecies, a um, bunch of turtles, uh, 16 snakes, lizard, 11 salamanders, and two, uh, 12 frogs. And for me, being somewhat centralized in Southern Ontario here, I actually have um, the benefit of not being too far from a lot of different places to see some different species. So back in 2017, I did this uh, thing I called the, the herping big year, which is a common thing for, for birders. They see how many species of birds they can see in a year. And I wanted to do it for species of reptiles and amphibians. So I had seen most of these species or subspecies before, um, but I still had a whole bunch of goals that I wanted to set up 
um, for seeing more of these species and see them in specific areas. So I set this boundary of where I wanted to search uh, and came up with a, a series of goals. And so here I wanted to see a, a queen snake hibernacula that I expected for a long time. Um, I wanted to see another Carolina gray rat snake, specifically one that wasn't radio tracked because I had helped a few times with that and uh, I wanted to find one on my own. I wanted to see an Eastern hognose snake in March. Uh, I thought that was a little bit of an ambitious goal because it's not always so warm in, in March, um, but we had some warm springs last few years. So I, I decided to, to put that one up there and challenge myself. Uh, I want to see a butler's garter snake in the disjunct population at Luther Marsh, revisit a wood turtle population that I got to do some uh, volunteering uh, with nesting stuff at about five years ago. And I uh, wanted to see a, a local mud puppy um, population as well. And if any of you have gotten the chance to go to Oxford Mills, it's the only place where I, I had seen mud puppies before and it's where Fred runs the um, a mud puppy nights and it's absolutely incredible. And so if you get a chance, you should definitely go do that. But for me, that's over five hours away. So uh, I definitely wanted to find one that was a little closer to home um, where I could see them a little more readily. And then uh, the last species, uh, last uh, goal was a special salamander. And I'm not going to say exactly what it was because you just have to see it in a second. Um, but on top of all this, the most important thing, of course, is just to have fun with it. Um, if you're not having fun, what are you doing, right? So we all love to do this. So let's get out and uh, do what we love to do. <clears throat> As the pandemic kind of started in March um, here in Ontario, we were already getting limited on, on where we can go and what we could do. So as soon as the sun hit and it was warm enough, I was out there, I wanted to see my scaly friends. And so I went to this local nature reserve. I uh, took my girlfriend, who's terrified of snakes, by the way, um, and we saw a bunch of garter snakes and uh, a couple of red bellies and brown snakes. Um, but what I was super excited to see was clusters of northern ribbon snakes. Uh, and there was a bunch basking on the trail. You can see in the in the one picture on the left there, me holding um, a handful. There was this vernal pool where they kind of hibernate around the edges of it. And so they were actually trying to form like a mating ball on the trail. So I had to move them uh, over. There's lots of bikers and walkers and stuff and stuff. And uh, it was so cool to see that and to see my girlfriend's reaction <laughs> as I asked her to take this picture for me. Um, and I also had uh, one of the great things about her being those impromptu education sessions uh, of young family with a, a boy who was about four years old came by and was absolutely elated to see uh, snakes out in the wild and be able to see them up close. So that was really awesome. And then we had kind of the patchy uh, or I guess you can call it spotty, <laughs> pun intended, um, weather that comes with March. Um, it, and it really was kind of cold for the majority of it and didn't really have those warm spring rains that I always look forward to that brings out the amphibian life. And so we're already right at the end of March here. Um, but I reached out to a friend who had seen this special salamander I talked about a second ago. Um, and I said, hey, can we meet up social distance, walk uh, into... Um, this this population of spotted salamanders and try and see this special salamander. And so we did just that. Um, we drove separately, stayed our, our distance, uh, six feet distance apart, and walked in. And we were um, pleasantly welcomed by tons of spotted, tur uh, spotted turtles, mm -hmm. spot spotted salamanders walking across the forest floor and crossing over logs and going into the water to, to create these little uh, mating balls that were starting to form. So you can see some of the spotted salamanders in there starting to congregate. And then you see this weird pink and black thing. And you're like, what is that? That is the special salamander. So this is a spotted salamander that is piebald or partially leucistic. I'm actually not entirely sure, but I think you'd call it piebald. Uh, and it is goal number one of my list. So already it's just March and I've already got a goal. And look at this. This is the most beautiful, weird mutation salamander. I mean, they're all beautiful, but it's just a stunning animal. And so this population actually has a handful of them that they've, that uh, a few people have documented over the years. I think this individual, uh, recognizable by its pattern, has been seen a handful of times as well. And they presume it to be over 20 years old. So it was really cool to see um, one of these special salamanders and to knock out a goal right away so early. <laughs> then, of course, I had 
my time limits on that March Eastern hognose snake. And unfortunately, it passed because of that uh, colder weather that came through. Um, but early April had some sunshine and some above 10 degree uh, days. And so I went out there and I searched for Eastern hognose snakes and I, uh, I found a few of them. Um, you can see in this picture on the left, uh, the yellow and black hognose snake. I was watching and kind of scoot around looking for something, probably a mate. And I took these pictures and I kid you not, I did not even realize that there's a second hognose snake in the picture underneath the uh, little log jam up in the, the top left. And so it's so cool to, to see that. And I actually came back um, later on to the same spot to see if they were still there. And I saw uh, this. And this is a that male mating with a, I think it's a different female, Eastern hognose snake. And so they got their tails wriggling around each other there. And uh, they stopped when I got too close to realize my presence was there. But it was so cool to see uh, those natural behaviors that if you just kind of sit back uh, from a distance and, and watch, um, you get to observe some cool things. And so I just took that quick video and then uh, left them be. Uh, and then so after that, where most people had their um, research canceled for the year, my blue racer research team had the go ahead. And so we had to go down to Peely Island, um, which was a bit tricky during a pandemic. Uh, we packed my car full of a month's worth of food for six people. Um, you can imagine my suspension was completely bottomed out. And uh, each of us on the team had to quarantine for at least two weeks um, before we headed down to the island. And so we finally got there. And the first few days, um, much to our disapproval, were snowy and cold. Um, but that's just what you deal with. So we got the chance to get to know each other, uh, playing cards and things like that in the house we were staying at. But after a few days, the sun came out and so did the snakes and we were there to see them. And so right away, we started seeing some blue racers coming out of hibernation. Um, and you can see just how happy everyone was to see these incredible uh, snakes on Peely Island. One of the nice things about being on Peely Island is you already are kind of uh, not, you're a little bit isolated, but secluded and it's not so busy. And so you really get to enjoy the, the peace and the serenity of it. And you get to walk around these open fields and you can even bask on top of artificial cover like a snake without being judged. <laughs> and especially during the pandemic when no one else is there to see it. Um, and so as the warmer weather came, uh, we started seeing more snakes come out of hibernation. And this one snake in particular, we saw poking its head out of a hole in the ground for, I think it was two or three days in a row. And the homeowner of the place where we were staying said, why don't you take this, uh, I don't know what they're called, boroscope or plumber's camera, a little camera on the uh, little string there, and put it down and see if you can see it. And so we did just that. And you can see we... We got a picture of this snake. I won't tell you what it is yet, but you might know. Um, kind of staging its way up out of the hibernacular wedge between the limestone bedrock. And so this was the first time I was ever actually to see a snake down in a hole during hibernation. So that was really cool. And while we were waiting for it to come out uh, and doing other surveys, we also poked around the island to see some other cool species. Uh, I got to recognize the plants. We saw some prickly pear cactus and uh, honestly, fields of uh, Ontario's flower, the trillium, uh, pink and white stages. And then we saw these absolutely adorable little Fs of the red spotted newts. Um, and they are a little bit darker um, here. Typically they're red, but on Peely Island, they, they're often quite dark like this. And then our snake came out of its hole. It was an absolutely beautiful male Eastern fox snake. And they are the most gentle, sweet animals. Um, it was, they're always incredible to, to work with. And to be able to see that snake over a, like a week's time frame of kind of in the hibernacle and actually see it up um, and out moving around was honestly really, really incredible. And of course, we started seeing more blue racers um, in the forest and in the grasses along the edges of fields. And then we also saw them in things like this. And so if you're a blue racer researcher, you know that sometimes you deal with really thick vegetation. And so there is a blue racer in this picture. Um, and so I'll give you guys a second here to try and find it. Uh, and it, I'll give you a hint, it's not in the middle of the picture. Um, 
But so this is sometimes what you're faced with. You have to find blue racers uh, in this type of habitat. And so if you're having a hard time, I'll direct your eyes up here. And so up basking on this vine draped tree is this magnificent, I think this is honestly, I think this is about a five foot or four and a half foot blue racer. Just out of sight, out of mind. You wouldn't expect to see it there. Um, but it's just incredible to, to see how uh, they use their environment to uh, evade predators and what they do to kind of maneuver around. So that was the end of the, of the Peely Island. We cracked a few beers and said our goodbyes to our local friend that we made and quarantined with for a whole month down the island. And it was sad to go, but I was also excited to get back to the mainland and uh, start checking off some other goals that I had made um, and see some species there. So. This was only a few days after I got back. I went down with another one of the guys from the, the team um, for a day of herping that I will not soon forget, but did not expect to have coming. And so I went to some old stomping grounds um, and first of all, saw this beautiful site, which is a freshly prescribed burned um, grassland. And I love habitat restoration. Um, those of you who know me, it just is one of my favorite things. So to see this was absolutely incredible. Um, it was very beneficial for the species. And it was nice to see, especially because it was so cloudy and a lot of herps weren't going to come out until sun started peeking through. And as soon as it did, we started seeing snakes. So we wanted to get some, my friend wanted to see some Eastern hognose snakes. And we did just that. I think we saw seven of these guys in total. Um, we had this beautiful, um, female first thing in the morning she had just came out of that uh, clump of grass you can see her body still uh back end of her body still in there and she was uh gravid trying to catch any little bit of sun that she could to heat up her babies and we also saw a couple of adults uh, sub adults um booting around and this is one of the most beautiful hognose snakes that i've uh, seen to date um, i really like the yellow ones um, and so it was really really incredible and doing all this so early in the morning, we said, okay, let's try our luck. Let's go see if we can find uh, some Eastern fox snakes. Um, and so we got in the car, drove to where we wanted to go and looked for a good amount of time for Eastern fox snakes, but to no avail, um, and which was too bad. But right at the end of our searches for Eastern fox snakes, we came across something maybe even better um, it was this absolutely gorgeous female spotted turtle. I mean, look at those little spots and the little face. Um, they're so cute. And just to watch them clums clumsily like moving around in the little wetlands is, is absolutely incredible. Um, so we were super happy to see that. Um, and right at the end of the hike too. So it's always nice when you're feeling a little defeated um, to, to come across something uh, like this. And then I decided with this luck that we're having, I want to go see my Carolinian gray rat snake. Uh, and so we, this is, and this is no easy feat. I mean, they're needles in haystacks. And um, I really wanted to see one from a different population uh, that I hadn't seen before. But my friend who also helped radio track them um, at this one population a few years back, uh, he convinced me to go look at the same population, see if we could just see one um, and not to try and push our luck. Uh, and so we went and went to this log that we thought we might uh, see one because they frequent it. And right away, uh, just luck of the draw, sitting right on top of the same log that we expected was a gray rat snake or black rat snake or central rat snake or whatever you want to call it nowadays. Um, but it was, it was awesome nonetheless um, to see this snake. Unfortunately, it has SFD. Um, you can see by the face there, it's got that, that cloudiness and it was missing an eye, but it was really incredible to see uh, that snake and to be so lucky to see it so quickly. Um, and so you'd think that that was already the most incredible day. And so you'd think we'd be done, but no, on the way home, we saw queen snakes. So they weren't at the hibernacula. Of course, it's too late in the year at this point, um, but they weren't at the hibernacula where I wanted to see. Uh, that was one of my goals, but we flipped uh, a... I think, oh, actually, we only flipped this little tiny baby. And you can see all the pebbles on top of its head. Um, probably the cutest snake you're ever going to see. <laughs> but we also found a few adults that were basking in the, in the branches above the water um, along this creek edge as well. 
so that was one of the the best days I had, uh, and well, I will not forget that day. And then, of course, I was back home with all the Zoom uh, meetings that we're all so used to now and doing data input and things like that. So I would poke out from time to time to some of the local areas. I'd see more of the northern ribbon snakes, uh, like in the top left. I also got some new species um, for the year, which is the northern ringneck snake in the top right, um, the eastern milk snake in the bottom right. And uh, I even caught the, the tail end of the great tree frog breeding season. I uh, just, my fault, missed a good chunk of it. And so it was cool to see uh, one of these guys actually in the daytime. I usually only see them at night um, at one of the local ponds. And I saw something else that was really unique. Um, this milk snake is not gravid. Those are not eggs. Um, that is another snake in its belly. Uh, and so I, I didn't get to actually witness the snake eating uh, another snake. I didn't even uh, know it was uh, had a full belly when I first picked it up. But I flipped the piece of cover and saw a milk snake underneath it. I picked it up and I realized it had all those bumps in it. And so I was like, this snake's too small to be gravid. And so I asked, I took a picture and sent it to a friend and asked, I said, what's going on here? And it's a, another snake that's basically too big for the milk snake's belly. And it creates those little kinks, those those bumps all the way down because it doesn't actually fit. So it's just stuffed in uh, the milk snake's belly. So that was really cool. Uh, okay, so I only had two goals for the year. So I wanted to get uh, another goal off my list. I wanted to go see Luther's Marsh uh, Butler's Garter Snakes. I went out with my friend Sterling um, in, in search of them. Uh, the forecast looked great. The weather was good at the start. Um, we saw a couple garter snakes, got really excited, thought they were going to be butlers and turn out to be Easterns. Still awesome, but not what we were looking for. Um, and we saw plenty of dragonflies that were saving grace for all the mosquitoes and deer flies that were attacking us. And they were swarming around us, picking them off. Um, but unfortunately, it started raining. Uh, so we had to abandon all searching of the snakes. And so... And, Instead of wasting a whole trip out to Luther Marsh, we decided to go look for uh, some frogs. And we weren't really finding anything, which was kind of odd, until we got to this one uh, stretch of road. We started seeing some green frogs and mink frogs. And my friend Sterling says to me, he says, there's a blue mink frog in this ditch. And I said, no, there's not. No way. And he says, yeah, look, come look. So I went and looked, took a quick glance. And I said, no, it's not blue. And he said, yeah, dude, look, it's blue. And so I took another close look and he was right. It was a blue mink frog. So this is an exanthic mink frog. I've seen it before in green frogs and bullfrogs and uh, leopard frogs, but I never even heard of it in mink frogs. Um, and so I asked some people online as well, and I, they had never heard about it or seen pictures of it either. So if someone here has, please let me know. It, it was really unique, but I, we were just shocked to see uh, this blue mink frog. Um, yeah, I was glad I got uh, got some pictures, and Sterling made me take a double look at, at this frog that I didn't believe in was in the side of the ditch. Uh, and then, so I was back down to Peely Island. This time we had our turtle permits. Um, and Jordan was my field assistant at the time, was super excited because he loves turtles. I mean, who doesn't? Um, and so we were out doing turtle surveys and we saw Blanding's turtle in one of the roadside ditches. <clears throat> I warned him, I said, don't slide down the roadside ditch. You're going to get poison ivy because, I mean, those things are covered with it. But he did. And he came out and lo and behold, had this uh, female Blanding's turtle. And so we took our measurements and process, and we noticed it had a really uniquely dark plastron. I mean, this plastron was almost entirely black. Usually they're patterned with black and uh, kind of an orangish coloration. Um, yeah, and so we took our, our photos and measurements and put it right back. And then a few days later, Jordan's legs were covered in poison ivy. Uh, but I bet you to this day, he'll still tell you it was worth it for that little smiling face on that turtle. Um, another cool thing I saw a few days later was another blue racer that I, when I first caught her in the field, I said, this is the ugliest snake, ugliest blue racer I've ever seen. Uh, and they're all beautiful, but it was particularly drab looking. Um, and then we realized why. When, we, when I was processing it, it started to shed its skin in my hands. 
And so this blue racer shed its entire skin. And I have a video of it. It's too long to show, but um, just it kind of moved through my hands and shed its skin perfectly. And it turned out to be one of the most beautiful blue racers I'd ever seen. And her name is Lucy. And I love Lucy. <laughs> and that's where the name came from. And then we saw another blue snake. And this seemed to be a year of crazy blue mut mutations. Um, this one is an eastern garter snake, a melanistic eastern garter snake, but also exanthic. I don't know actually what to call it. Um, but when we flipped it, there's so that about 30% or more of the population of garter snakes on Pewley Island are melanistic, meaning they express uh, more of the black pigmentation. They look almost entirely black, minus the uh, white chin and some white scales down the sides. Um, and so that's pretty common to see. But then on closer inspection, this snake didn't have white scales. It had blue scales, like bluer than the blue racers you would see. Um, and so we were just absolutely shocked uh, at the snake. I mean, you can tell from the photos, it's just an incredible looking individual. And so I think we settled on calling it exanthic melanistic. But if someone else wants to tell me what this would actually be called, I'd be super open to hearing what it is. Um, we had actually seen this individual a handful of times, haven't seen her since last year, but uh, maybe she'll pop up again. I hope she does. More turtle surveys. Uh, came, pulled up this pile of basking buddies. Um, we had a Blandings turtle with Midland painted turtles and a snapping turtle all in one tiny little cluster um, for an awesome photo. So we, I couldn't turn that down. I borrowed my friend's long lens and, and snapped the photograph. And of course, while you're on Pelee Island, you also have to go to the southernmost point in Canada uh, or inhabited point in Canada. And uh, it's just incredible views. And then Mosquito Point Woods, I have to highlight because it's the most green place that I've ever been to. I mean, there was no other, like the brown of the trees, but it was green. And rightfully so, it was also filled with green frogs. And so if you look closely all over the fallen logs in the, in the water, it was just green frog city. Um, which is always nice to see. Uh, back home, I hadn't seen a Massasauga rattlesnake in all of 2019, which for me was a shame. So again, my friend Sterling and I, at this point, <clears throat> when I say my friend, it's Sterling, we created this little quarantine bubble uh, with just us two. And so um, we decided to do what we call uh, a rocket run up to uh, the Bruce Peninsula. So it was a four hour drive each way. And we obviously can't stay anywhere overnight because everywhere is closed. Um, but so we got up early morning, drove four hours, uh, and then in the evening drove four hours back home. Um, but it was so worth it because we saw this gorgeous male um, Massasauga on an open alvar. And I also saw my first Bruce Peninsula smooth green snake. Apparently, they're fairly common up there, but I had never seen one. Other than just a species that evades me. I don't know. I had a hard time. So I was super excited. Uh, to finally see one along uh, the edge of a wetland. Uh, and it made the eight hours of driving that day totally worth it. Uh, when I got back home, I helped another friend in Niagara with some uh, snake surveys, and we saw more smooth green snakes. But what's cool, well, another thing that was cool was we also saw smooth green snake eggs. Uh, and I had seen them hatched before, um, like an old nest, but I'd never seen fresh ones. And so this picture, you can actually see the little baby smooth green snake developing inside the egg. You can see it's a little eyeball. And so it was really, really neat to, to be able to see the species and uh, their eggs all, in one, all at once. <clears throat> okay, and so that brings me to uh, August when it's baby season. And as I mentioned earlier, um, Allie, my girlfriend, is terrified of snakes and frogs and other herps. And so I figured let's take a little mini road trip vacation and uh, it's baby season. So what better way to get over our fear than baby herps? Um, so we stopped in first at Arrowhead Provincial Park and a few other parks and did some hiking. Um, and it's absolutely beautiful. So I recommend you go there if you ever get the chance. Uh, and then to get over our fear of, her of uh, herps, we started with baby turtles. There's no better way to do that. Um, so my best friend Taylor from Scales met up with us um, with a freshly hatched clutch, I think actually two clutches of snapping turtles. Uh, and we got to help them release them back into a uh, roadside wetland. And I mean, look at Allie's face, she's so happy. Uh, and this was the turning point. 
this <laughs> this was good news for me. So we got to help some baby turtles and uh, start to appreciate reptiles just a, a little bit more. And we also did some more walking at, I think this was Torrance Barrens. I got to show Ali some ecosystems, the uh, rock barrens and bogs that she hadn't been able to see before. And we also got to see some five line skinks that were scurrying around. Uh, they're fast little guys, but this uh, adult female kept on poking up on top of this one log. So I was able to grab a, a picture of her. And then they also had their babies that had freshly hatched. So I got a picture of this uh, little hatchling five line skink with a stunning blue tail that you get to see um, right as soon as they hatch uh, and they start to lose as they get older, especially the males. Um, but then a few days uh, later, we went out with Taylor again to do some uh, Massasauga surveys and uh, we were looking for neonates, clutches of, of baby Massasaugas. And so this is the kind of area that they are born in. Uh, it's called a gestation site. Uh, the females uh, use those big table rocks to hide underneath and they bask all around them uh, all summer long until they're ready to give birth to these little guys. <clears throat> and so we were able to see a couple of little babies. I think there's two, maybe three neonates in this picture just basking together um, underneath some vegetation. Uh, and then we saw another clutch. Oh, oh yeah, it's working. Um, that was sitting on the edge of one of those table rocks. The mother had already left, but these guys were catching a few uh, rays of sunlight before they were going to head off to start their journey. So I think there was uh seven or eight of those little guys that we got to see and so that that was really exciting september and october was back to Pelee island and some of us were really really tired after all of our long days of surveying and i just thought this picture was so funny and represented uh how intensive our surveys are really well uh, nathan actually fell asleep on top of a vehicle um while waiting for other people to finish <laughs> Uh, so we're kind of expected this point, end of October, we're like, this is, uh, that's kind of it for herps. Um, but November had some surprisingly warm weather, uh, in the first week or so. And so I went out again to one of those local areas and we saw, uh, a few four toed salamanders, some blue spotted salamanders, uh, a couple of Northern water snakes. And again, those Northern ribbon snakes. Uh, and I brought those up again, cause this was one of the most surprising things in November. In the one day we saw, I think almost 60 different northern uh, northern ribbon snakes. And it was just incredible to see um, that many out uh, uh, in a November day. <clears throat> and as the warm weather continued in November, I took my dad back down to Peely Island just one more time to show him where I work. And we dipped our toes in the in the beach in November. I mean, how many people can say they do that, right? Um, and watch the sunset. And our way to the beach, we even found a herb. We got a Lake Erie water snake that was crossing the road, probably headed off to its hibernacular where it would have spent uh, the rest of its uh, the year and the rest of the winter. Of course, when winter comes around, so does the mud puppy. And so this was goal number three, and I was successful. This is a local mud puppy, um, not even 30 minutes from my house after a few weeks of continuous searching of this one creek. A friend and I actually uh, were able to turn up two of these marvelous salamanders um, walking along the uh, mucky river floor um, and got to actually see one of them. It looked like it was foraging, um, looking around for crayfish or something as well. And so that was really cool to see. Um, and I tried to see them again later in the year, but I'm glad we saw them when we did because I think only a week after this picture was taken, the entire uh, creek was iced over and you couldn't see in it at all and you could even walk on top of it so the long winter ahead um i guess it's longer from some other people for some other people but uh brought us all the way to the next uh herp which is in march as soon as the ice started to melt and i say started because it wasn't fully melted i got out and saw my first reptile of 2021 and it was a spotted turtle um that's not usually my first reptile it's usually a garter snake so i was super excited and what was the coolest thing about these observations where you can see in the picture on the left the turtle basking on a little um, grass island but on the top of the picture you can still see the ice uh that's covering a lot of the water so almost half of the the water body there was still iced over and these turtles cold tolerant little guys were out basking nonetheless 
<clears throat> and then, well, I guess I shouldn't show the picture. Oh, well, too late. I got my queen snake hibernacula. I didn't, so in previous years, I had this suspected spot where I thought they might hibernate, but I've tried several times in April and uh, I could never find them there or using what I expect to be the hibernacula. And this time I decided to go in March. Uh, I thought it's probably too early, but why not? Let's give it a shot. Mid-March, uh, went to this uh, this location where I had frequented uh, many times before. And lo and behold, not one, not two, there was actually four queen snakes all right around uh, on this little uh, shrub on the edge of the water. So you can see two here, one heading towards the back, one sitting in the middle, and there was two on the other side. And I got to just sit and watch them. And one of them actually went down one of the holes that are at the base of that tree. And I watched it go back into its hibernacula. Um, another fun thing about this is I saw a fifth queen snake that I didn't expect at another um, little entrance to hibernacula. But this snake was almost entirely under one single leaf. Um, so I was just glad, honestly, that I didn't step on it. And it goes to show you have to be so uh, careful and observant when you're looking for these things, not to disrupt anything or to harm anything. Um, so this snake, had, uh, I didn't bother it at all. I just left it under its leaf, but it was honestly like this far, uh, a couple inches from uh, another hole that I expect to be another hibernacula. So I'm going to go back and check that um, maybe next year. <clears throat> and I said to myself, okay, if the queen snakes are out, the ribbon snakes are out. Um, and now you've seen quite a few ribbon snake pictures, but this one's interesting because I followed this male to this. Um, and it's a mating congregation of northern ribbon snakes. And so you can see uh, the female is the one sticking her head up from underneath that rock, looks really straight, and her face is a bit blurry. And there's eight or nine males all around her that clearly have noticed my presence and are, are wondering what's going on, um, but they um, quickly re, uh, restarted uh, frantically looking uh, for the receptive female, and you can even see a male coming in from the back uh, on the top of the picture, and so that actually might be the male that I followed. Um, so it's really cool to see uh, that happening as well. And the warm weather of that day continued and brought rains uh, in the night, and so I stuck around, busted out my headlamp as everyone uh, every herper has a headlamp, at least one in their car. And so I started seeing salamanders and frogs right away. Um, we got blue spotted salamanders crossing the path. I think four toads, I got green frogs and bullfrogs. Uh, we had spring peepers, wood frogs, you name it. Everything was out end of March um, or close to the end of March, spring warm rains. Uh, the amphibian life is just incredible uh, to witness. We also saw the unisexual salamanders that we got to hear a talk on at the beginning of the conference uh, and the Jefferson salamanders as well. And then uh, this is already close to the end of March. And I said, well, this is my last chance really of the, of the year of the pandemic to try and get my goal of this March Eastern hognose snake. Um, and so the weather wasn't perfect. It wasn't where I wanted it to be, but I said, it's March 30th or 31st at this point. And I said, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to go down and try and find the Eastern hognose snake in March. And I'm so glad that I did because one of the last few days, this little guy that came out of his hibernacula was halfway out when I saw him uh, coming out into this, uh, this low bush. And I got to watch him just kind of nose around and coil up and just bask in the first uh, few rays of sun that I'd seen uh, since he had gone down the last fall. And so I was just in pure bliss, sitting down, mutual respect with this animal, just watching each other. Uh, and then I left it be just coiled up in its little bush there. Uh, and I got my goal number five. So now we're really getting through the list here. Um, and we've got a few right away in this early 2021. There's only two left. Um, and so the other ones had to wait because I was back down to Pelee Island where we saw some smallmouth salamanders in the early spring. Uh, we saw American toads all over the forest floor and sometimes while we were doing snake surveys as well. And then I saw this really unique blue racer uh, and actually Hannah caught this one. So this is, this is, oh, so I do have a snake from that day. Yay. So this is one of those, uh, I think this one would have been 
the cherry on the cake or something. I can't remember. But so in addition to being one of those awesome snakes, this blue racer was not blue. Um, so whereas 2020, we had all those blue, weird blue mutation individuals. This is the opposite. So this blue racer is almost entirely black. It almost looks like a northern black racer. And in fact, we joked about uh, it being a melanistic population of uh, blue racers on the island, like the garter snakes or a remnant uh, black racer population. Of course, that's not what it is, but it was cool to see um, such a dark colored individual nonetheless. Uh, and so here are some of my field staff, what I expected to be doing their turtle watching stances, but in reality, I think they were looking for birds. Um, but it's okay, it was all forgiven because later on, uh, they did find a, bl a blue racer. And so uh, it all was forgiven. Um, and we let that one slide. Uh, okay, so that, again, wrap up with Peel the Islands. I've talked about it a lot. Um, but I had another goal that I wanted to get off my list, uh, and it was to visit uh, a wood turtle population. Of course, this isn't a wood turtle. Um, this is a Blanding's turtle, but I went up to help a friend with some uh, turtle nesting surveys in June, and we saw probably around eight or 10 Blanding's turtles that were coming up onto the roadsides um, to nest. And this female was clearly looking for a place uh, to lay her eggs as well. And so we had to process her before she, before she did. And I was able to snap this uh, beautiful picture. And uh, while we're up in that area, it wasn't too far of a drive to the wood turtle population that I hadn't been to in about five years. And so I took my friend there um, and it was a few hours of searching before we finally turned up one gorgeous female wood turtle that's all sandy um, and dirty because she just finished laying her nest for the year and she was on her way back to her, her creek or river um, and we got to just watch her from a, a decent distance and she was uh, clamoring over the rocks and then headed back down into her um into her creek which was really really exciting to see and that is goal number six um so there's only one left now and i couldn't believe i'd actually been getting through um all of these goals that i had set out to do of course i expected to do them a little bit faster i didn't know how long the pandemic would last i just wanted to do them in 2020 but we'll pretend i i aim for a full two years for these goals um while we were up there um I had discovered, again, five years ago, a population of northern two-line salamanders. So, of course, I wanted to go see if we could uh, find some more individuals there I hadn't seen uh, in half a decade. And so, right along the uh, creek banks, we flipped some rocks and we were able to turn up a few of the northern two-line salamanders, Oops. Um, which they're always so cool to see and they're not close to my home. So, they're one of the species I don't get to see very often. Um, and as fast as we saw them, we ran out of there because the mosquitoes were just covering us uh, like crazy and we could only take it for so long. Oh, uh, I forgot, I was supposed to, okay. So um, back to Southern Ontario, um, it had been a little while since I had seen um, a Carolinian Massasauga rattlesnake. Uh, and so I had just seen those babies up North, but a couple of friends and I, uh, they wanted to go birding and I wanted to go look for rattlesnakes. And so I said, why don't we at least uh, head out there? And so you got Sterling um, in the orange shirt there, my friend Billy and the other in the white shirt. And we were kind of bushwhacking, looking, they were looking for birds and I was looking for snakes. Uh, and it seemed for like an endless amount of time uh, until you come across this beautiful site and right at their feet there, a few feet in front of them, is a gravid female, a Massasauga rattlesnake from a Carolinian population. And so it was absolutely incredible to see this snake and it made, it made all of our day. Um, it was so worth it, the hard bushwhacking you're doing. Um, but then on top of that, not even 30 minutes later, um, we were doing more bushwhacking and something uh, caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. And it was another Massasauga rattlesnake but it caught my attention because it looked like this. Not only was it a mass, a, another, another Carolinian Massasauga rattlesnake, it was basking one or two feet up off the ground. And I kid you not, this picture doesn't do it justice. It looked like a freshly polished loony. 
like it was shining gold yellow rattlesnake so it was absolutely incredible to see and the best part of it was like the gravid female it didn't move a muscle we got to take out pictures of it sitting up uh on top of its uh little basking spot there and then just let it be um so that was so so incredible uh and we were we made that trip more than worth it it was one of the best snakes i had seen that year i think this year and so of course i have my last goal left my luther's marsh butler's garter snake and so i haven't been able to go out in the field too much this summer because i've been busy doing uh, my master's work and and a bunch of other stuff and so i did make one trip out to luther's marsh and this time i found nothing I still haven't got my Luther's Marsh Butler's Garter Snake, but that's okay. I'm actually happy about that because it gives me something to, uh, another thing to strive for this uh, fall. And if I don't get it this fall, I can always try again next year. And that's the beautiful thing about setting up these goals is you don't have to get every one of them. You can just enjoy the time you had on the field with good company and seeing the herbs that we love. Um, and so I've got another goal to look forward to, and I'm, I'm definitely going to set up more goals for next year. Uh, so I hope that this talk has kind of encouraged some of you to maybe do the same in your local areas. Um, and so what I want to end with is just kind of giving you some ideas of <clears throat> what you can do for herping locally. And so, of course, you first want to look at what local species you have, or maybe if you've seen the local species, what populations you have in different areas. Um, and specifically, I encourage you to think about uh, if there's any species or areas that are lacking information uh, that you can help provide knowledge gaps for. So like that queen snake hibernacula for me, uh, that's one that we had no idea where they hibernated at that site. And so I really wanted to set that goal to, to be able to report that and contribute to that population. So things like that, maybe a, a place where a certain species hasn't been seen for a long time, you can go out and search, um, search for that or something. Uh, just give a little bit of thought and the winter time uh, as unherpable as it is it's a good time to research and plan and set up these goals for the next year uh, and the most important thing i want to leave with is to remember just to get out in nature have some fun and you really never know what you might come across when you're trying to get those goals that you did set up um, yeah and so that's what i'm going to leave with i did i don't think i have time i did try and add a little bit of uh travel in i was going to show a, a pennsylvania weekend camping trip but uh i guess i'll leave that for now and open up to questions uh, unless we do have a little bit more time i'd show these pictures but uh, that is my travelogue talk thank you ryan that was gorgeous we do actually have to till 12 15 there are some questions and there's been a ton of chat activity um but do you think you could do it within the 15 minutes uh i can do it in three if i speed through perfect do it. <laughs> okay so <clears throat> this is all from one weekend trip to pennsylvania before covid and hopefully it inspires you to do a little bit more travel herping as well and i chose pennsylvania out of all my herp trips because it's still kind of local it wasn't that far i actually drove farther for some of the species that you saw in my presentation than i did for this one it was only a four hours drive um, and right away when we got to our campsite we started searching the local creeks and we were finding spring salamanders northern two-line salamanders dusky salamanders galore redback salamanders the, uh, this one, the northern slimy salamander, which is a species that we don't have in Canada. Uh, and my favorite from the first day was the long-tailed salamander. And I kid you not, these guys look like uh, they're a little kid's toy, like a rubber orange salamander. They're incredible, and they're just south of the border. Um, so it's really cool to see those. And then, of course, being a snake guy, I definitely wanted to see some uh, timber rattlesnakes, which is a species we used to have in Canada. We don't anymore. Um, and so I got some tips for, from some local friends in Pennsylvania, and I went out, and I have to tell this story because it's kind of exciting. Um, I was scaling this uh, edge of a mountain, I guess. It's more like a hill mountain. It wasn't too, too steep that it was dangerous. But anyways, I was pretty much climbing up this hillside and I poked my head over this top ledge as I was climbing up and all I heard was 
this crazy rattling noise. And it was a pile of my first timber rattlesnakes that I ever got to see. And so this picture doesn't show them all. I think there was uh, eight of them. Uh, most of them were black, like these individuals. Uh, and some of them were peering over the edge of that, uh, that overhang that I told you I kind of peeked over. <clears throat> and so my heart was filled with adrenaline and excitement to see these snakes. Um, Cause of course it's, it has been a long time goal of mine. Uh, we were also searching uh, riparian edges and uh, some of the rivers and in particular in the rivers we were searching for this. Uh, this is an Eastern hellbender. Uh, and this individual was uh, around the two foot mark and we actually saw four of them. Um, this one, we, we, I guess, spooked it. It swam out um, from some of the rocks that we were walking beside. And so we got to see, uh, this incredible species of aquatic salamander. It's the only species that's bigger than the mud puppies that we have. And so that was really cool to see. Uh, and we also, uh, in one of the feeding creeks, got to see the northern red salamander, which is another one of those salamanders that look like a toy. I mean, bright red. And they actually they have like a little French mustache, which is something I love about them. They got the, the little black mustache on the upper lip. Um, and so it was really cool to see uh, such a vibrantly colored salamander. And we also got to see northern copperheads, uh, which is the first time I had ever seen them. Uh, and they blend into the leaf litter like nothing else. Uh, and we also got to see baby timber rattlesnakes and some beautiful yellow and black ones and a uh, black racer um, as well. And so that's, that's my very quick summary of the Pennsylvania local herping. That was awesome. The chat <laughs> agrees with me that that was absolutely worth it. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Welcome. You've got, so I, I don't think you've been able to see the chat through, but there have been so many comments about how gorgeous <laughs> your photos are and how wonderful the species you found and amazing the diversity you found. And I pulled out a few. Uh, we'll Thank see you. how many we can get through, uh, but I'll jump back to the beginning. So when you were showing us the photo on your laptop of a boroscope going into a, like, seeing the fox snake underground, yeah. Pam actually said that uh, Steve Marks is going to use that photo for the next Great Canadian Herb Quiz. Ah. <laughs> so you can pass that along. <laughs> Um, and then next in the so yes so many compliments of the gorgeous photos I can't even go over them but at one point you were looking at uh, the baby queen snake that you flipped and so Damien's question was uh, what was your rocks flipped to queen snake found ratio you know what Damien it's funny I think I only flipped like two rocks um and it's because it was it's because there's not really a lot of rocks to flip um at this one site and so for the most part i would just look for them uh basking in the shrubs uh, along the water's edge um and it was just one of those areas where i'd seen queen snakes before and so i just gave one of the small rocks a flip and i was shocked to actually see one underneath it uh and to see a little baby was just uh enthralling so i guess 50 50 <laughs> Okay, I don't know if we wanted to know that answer. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then, so a little later on, you were showing a photo of the Blanding's turtle with the really, really dark plastron. And Scott was saying that the high iron in the water makes them go purple to black. <laughs> and your melanistic xanthic garter snake. You've yeah. got agreement from Steve that it is a xantha, it is xanthic and melanistic. You nailed it. Um, were there white scales under the chin? No, all blue. What the heck? I don't know. It was a weird snake. <laughs> uh, and so then there's a question later on that I'm just going to tweak a little bit from Gabrielle. But what do you do with your sightings? particularly of those rare ones? Do you submit them somewhere or how do you handle that? Yeah, so um, all of the rare sightings go into uh, an NHIC report at the end of the year. Um, I, a few of my friends use iNaturalist a lot for the common species as well. Uh, I tend to not use iNaturalist a lot. Um, for the common species, I will. 
but for the the rare stuff, I, I send it to NHIC directly. And yeah, for those of you outside of Ontario, the NHIC <laughs> is the Ontario Natural Heritage Information Center. It's the provincial conservation data center that hosts all of the rare and specially protected locations for species. Um, and each province, I believe, has their own conservation data center. Um, but if you were to submit those rare sightings to iNaturalist, which was what the original question was about, though they, the NHIC does have an iNaturalist project that automatically picks them up. Um, but either way, they do get in to be helpful for science, which is awesome. Okay, the next, there's a bit of a conversation around spotted turtles. Uh, so you were talking about them being cold tolerant. There was a patch of ice in the pond you found them in. So Damien has said, yeah, they're cold tolerant, but their range stretches to Florida. <laughs> um, and it's such an incredible range compared to, to the Great Lakes exclusive Blandings turtle. Um, and then Megan was saying that she has eye button data from her master's degree showing hibernating spotties basking in January on the odd sunny warm day. Whoa, that's cool. And then Scott has had bat, uh, spotties basking on a small snowbank, <laughs> even closer to the frozen water, as well as Steve. And then I'm so very sorry, we have some pedantic folks. I believe on one of your wood turtle slides, you had called them grab temmies and they're actually glip temmies. Oh, I'm just sorry. passing it on from Damien. That's, that's fair. I should, I should have checked them honestly when I was writing and I, I didn't even look at them up. I just kind of typed it in from memory. So I figured one would slip in and I'm embarrassed that it's that one, but thanks Damien. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> uh, and then when you were talking about tips for what to do in the winter, Fred also add, added one of his own in the winter. Go to places where it looks like herps might be hibernating in the water and see if you can uh, doc document them in the winter, of course, without disturbing them too much. Yeah, and that works for the, the frogs too. It's not just the, like the salamander's mud puppy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so many thanks, wonderful travelogue. We are enjoying our emoji chat for sure. With so many hearts. Um, and then what kind of so Daphne? Sorry if I mispronounce your name. Uh, what kind of camera and zoom are you using? Um. So for some of the photos, it it changed. Uh, so right now I have actually it's right here. I have my uh, big fancy DSLR camera. Um, uh, I'm a Canon guy, so I have that one. Um, in terms of zoom, it really depends. Sometimes I like for those that, especially that little baby queen snake, you gotta get really close up. So I have like a big macro lens, which allows me to stay far enough back from the animal and still get a very up close uh, picture. And then I borrowed my uh, friend's lenses, uh, uh, like one of those really big zoom telephotos, 150 to 500 millimeters for some of those far away shots where you don't want to disturb anything. Um, and then some of them are, are just like your classic uh, portrait uh, lenses uh, that show a little bit of everything. Right. And it's hilarious to watch some of the crew walk around in the field covered in their camera gear. <laughs> <laughs> There's it doesn't work on racer surveys. You can't really do it. No. Uh, Darlene is saying that uh, Steve and they would then would like to would love to include the blue mink frog in their blue frog study. I have a feeling you know what that means. Yep. Yep. That that can definitely happen for sure. And Gabrielle, sorry I didn't catch this earlier, thanking you for answering the what you do to submit your herps. Um, they're saying the ribbon snakes are not doing well. Uh, they should definitely be documented so we can add them to the CACIWIC data, CACIWIC being the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, I hope. Um, and they assess our species for the species at risk lists that governments may take up and list. They often follow the advice of the 
Um, and then Damien saying uh, down east. Oh yes, it's a full Atlantic uh, data conservation center in the east. It's not by province. And then more thanks. And I don't see anything else. Sorry, I should have offered. You could have raised your hand, but I don't see any hands. We've got about four minutes, but then we will be taking a 15 minute break before coming back at 12.30 uh, Eastern to start session five. But if anyone else would like to ask Ryan any questions, pop it in the chat, raise your hand. Thank you so much. That was exactly what I thought and more. Uh, it was such a joy. Your photos are amazing. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm glad it worked out. It's different for a travel log where it's, we actually focus on some local stuff, but hey, everything's been different with the pandemic. Thanks okay. for the nomination. Yeah, of course. I'm glad you said yes. I'm, I hope you get better. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you feel better soon.